Hi everybody, this is the college class for uh, Kingsville for July the 12th. And Chris and I are here. And we're uh, in Luke chapter 9 this week. I have to admit to you that um, I am not feeling 100%. So uh, my head feels like it's really heavy on the top. And so I turn my head, I feel like I'm, I get dizzy. Old man. And uh, so anyway, so um, I seem a little more subdued. There you go, that's the reason. Um, and Chrissy's here, so she's gonna help um, keep me alert and going. Right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, here's the passage in Luke 9. There's actually, uh, the Sunday School lesson has um, three or four different passages, and I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't do all of those. They're all related to discipleship, and there's a theme um, in the Sunday School literature about, um, you know, uh, following the Lord fully, and so... Here, here. Um, but we're just going to take the first one and just uh, talk about it a little bit slower instead of trying to do all of those. Okay, so here, here's the passage um, in Luke 9. I've got it um, in the box here. So um, verse 51 starts, When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. So, Chris, if you would, uh, just as we're starting this, um, turn to, you got Luke chapter 9. Okay, so um, just uh, tell everybody, you look over in your Bible at the section just before the one we're reading. Do you have a title, like beginning in verse 28? I don't have titles. In oh, that's right. So do you see uh, the story there in verse 28? What that's all about. It's the Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah, so this is the, um, the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus and Elijah and Moses are all transfigured together. And then uh, in the words of Jesus, uh, just before the Mount of Transfiguration, look in verse 23. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So, at, I mean, if you're reading this for the first time um, and you don't know the story yet, you don't know that there's been that, that Jesus is crucified. So when he says, um, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross. So this was... Um, this was the Roman way. They, they ruled by punishing, humiliating anyone with crucifixion who did not um, do as they say. Um, so I just said, say it that way because that's really the context um, behind where we are right now that uh, the idea of taking up your cross. To the hearer of those words would have thought in their mind, this is a humiliating form of death that I must experience if I do not follow the Roman way. And that's what's in their mind. So Jesus says you have to take up your cross daily and follow me. Um, it's it, it is it is a call to death, really. Um, Jesus is not he's not mincing any words here. Um, so uh, when Jeff and I got together this week and talked about us talking about these verses with him, um, these these are some of the some of the difficult words of Jesus and, and following um, Jesus. It's a uh, there, there's no sense that I can find. Let's see if I can quote my friend Jeff on this. There's no, there's nowhere you can find 
in the presentation of following Jesus, where it's a half commitment, where, where it's, uh, yeah, he's part of my life kind of thing. But you just cannot find that in the New Testament. So um, to Jesus, it's, it's a 100% it's a I'm his or I'm not his at all. So there's the context, and then we get them out of transfiguration. Next, and then this, uh, this passage here starts in verse 51. So here we are again. I'll read the first phrase again. When the days were approaching for his ascension. So do you see on the PowerPoint slide there, Chris, the Greek word there for ascension, taking up or ascension? I'm not going to pronounce it correctly, but it looks like analimpsis. You see that? Mm -hmm. Analipsis. Um, that's a noun. Um, when I did the logo search on that, it's only found one time, that word in its noun form, once in the New Testament. Uh, its verb form is used by Luke again in the book of Acts. And I've got it just above there. See what it says there? To take up or take along. This is the verb that's, trans that's translated whenever Jesus is actually ascending. So, um, I might as well just read it. So, in Acts chapter 1, um, so Jesus says, You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. And then, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. As they were gazing intently, into the sky while he was departing behold two men stood behind them and they also said men of galilee why do you stand looking into the sky this jesus who has been an alembano it's the same um has the same greek origin word i'm gonna say it's a cognate form i I'm, whatever um so when when he says the days were approaching for his ascension, if you're reading this in Greek, uh, there's a couple things that can come to mind. So if you already know the story as to what happened to Jesus when he got to Jerusalem, and you say ascension, you might be thinking the way Jesus spoke in John chapter 3. The Son of Man must be lifted up. Put on, the put on the cross. So maybe he's talking about the cross. If, if this means, if he's thinking about, so he was determined to go to Jerusalem um, because the day's approaching for his ascension and he's thinking about the crucifixion here. If that's what we're supposed to be thinking about, crucifixion, then Luke is actually drawing a portrait of the crucifixion as um, as somehow a kind of coronation for Jesus. He's actually imaging that because as we keep reading on here, the Son of Man theme is going to be really prevalent. So I don't know exactly what to think there. Maybe it's both. Maybe we're supposed to be thinking he's going to be crucified in Jerusalem, but really he's thinking about not just the crucifixion, but also this, this, the, these are the events that are about to occur that are going to reveal him as the true son of man. What do you think? Yeah. She's nodding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Now, in just a second, I'm going to show you um, this verse, 51, where, so he's been in Galilee. The section where Jesus is doing all this thing in Galilee um, is, uh, starts in Luke 4. And I think this is why the Sunday School Literature does it this way. And there's a whole section of stuff he's doing there in Luke chapter 4. That's where Luke presents him. He goes to the temple, to the synagogue, and he says, I have brought the year of Jubilee. You know, that's how, okay, so this begins, verse 51 here in Luke chapter 9 begins a whole new section of Luke. And uh, Matthew 
and Mark do not have a section like this. And so it's a really famous section of the book of Luke that starts here in verse 51 called the travel narrative um, about his trip. So it's a huge section of the book that goes all the way through chapter 19. That is um, the section of Luke talking about Jesus traveling to Jerusalem. So it's an important spot here. And I think they picked a good one there to do, um, you know, for section, doing it by sections. Okay, so uh, verse 52. He sent messenger, oh wait, the ascension part. So the reason I had you go back and look at the transfiguration story is because um, Jesus is there on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. And there's all kinds of richness there that, that has brought, has flooded the reader's mind with imagery from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're thinking about somebody being taken up which is the verb form of that ascension word. Elijah does come to mind. Mm -hmm. um, um, okay, so we'll come back to that. So I put the reference there where that happens to Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 2. Okay, he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans. Now, we, uh, we talked... A couple of weeks ago, we went back and read a bunch of stuff about the Samaritans and who they were and why the Jews didn't like them and who they thought they were, etc. So what in your head, Chris, what 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 remains of that? Just the Samaritan stuff. They, they didn't think they were pure. OK, so the Jews didn't like them, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Um, and they had their reasons for that. And that that goes back to Old Testament stories about. Jews and the Samaritans. Aren't they a mixture of cultures? Mixtures. And they, the story is they, you know, during the exile, they stayed and then they brought them, other peoples in and they mixed with them. And it's a whole, so that they were, they were deemed less. Mm -hmm. They were deemed undesirable by the Jews. So that's what we're talking about the Samaritan woman at the well. Mm -hmm. But what did the Samaritans think about themselves? So we read that. They were, they, they were a proud they were a proud bunch. Um, in fact, they they have their own version of the Torah called the Samaritan Pentateuch. And you remember um, the uh, the coin with the temple at Mount Gerizim. See, the Samaritans thought that the true place of worship of Yahweh was not in Jerusalem; it was on Mount Gerizim. So remember the story about the echo chamber where he spoke and they responded in the middle and Mount Gerizim was on one side and Jacob's well is just down to the south there. Okay, so all of that's, <laughs> when I read here, he entered a village of the Samaritans, all of that's flooding back into my head. Okay, so they entered a village of the Samaritans. See, I've got a red one by that. Okay, can you see as the text goes on, there's a red two and a red yeah. three and a red four. Okay, so. Jesus is going to encounter here four people. The Samaritans, a people group or what, a group of people there. Okay, so if you're thinking in your head, when I say Samaritans, if you're thinking already, um, a proud people who thought Jerusalem wasn't the right place, then you got the right impression here. The temple, and there was a temple. Remember the coin? I put it back in this presentation. It showed the steps leading up to a temple that was built on Mount Gerizim for the Samaritans. Okay, so um, they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they, that being the Samaritans, did not receive him. So I think that's an important phrase here. And the first encounter here in the passage with the Samaritans is they rejected him. Mm -hmm. He's going to Jerusalem. And if he was to be the Messiah, he wouldn't be the right one because he's going to the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So they rejected him. Um, it's interesting in that regard because let me read you a little thing here. Whenever, right after the, uh, right after Saul stands there and they kill Stephen, 
-hmm. and all the persecution starts, it says that they were scattered. And you remember how this is the way Luke actually organizes the rest of the book of Acts. It says in, in Acts 8 that they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And then uh, in verse 4, or verse 5 of the chapter, it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. So the Samaritans are, so the story's over now. Well, Jesus has been crucified and ascended, resurrected and ascended. And now Philip is in Samaria telling them. So just put that in Luke's context here. Luke has Jesus going to the Samaritans here. <laughs> and they rejected him with their pride and arrogance. But he wasn't done with them. Um, just a little bit later in the chapter, in chapter 8, it says, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So it's like in Luke's world, you know, in the big picture of the world, this is the Samaritans, mm -mm, they're not going to be disciples of Jesus. And then they become disciples of Jesus. Yeah. So, okay. So that's number one, the Samaritans. And we're talking about them some more. Okay. It says, but they did. Did you want that reference? Mm -hmm. That's Acts chapter eight. Okay. I didn't put it in the PowerPoint slide. Okay. But they did not receive him. It says, because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. So do you see why it's important to know a little bit about the Samaritans there? Okay. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Now, when I say somebody's going to call fire down from heaven, Elijah. that's Elijah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Twice this happens. Elijah calls fire from heaven on Mount Carmel. Remember with the prophets of Baal. And then uh, Ahaziah, uh, who is a king of Samaria, um, he gets ill. I think it is. I should have read the whole story again. He gets ill and he, he calls on the god of Akron, whose name is Baalzebub. And then um, this really um, hacks off. Um, Elijah and God, and then Elijah sends word to him saying, what's your problem? And so he sends these 50 guys to get Elijah, say, come and, and do your prophet thing for me. And Elijah says, uh, if, if I'm a prophet, fire is going to come down from heaven, and, it, and it, it wipes these 50 guys out. It changes the whole tone of the story. <laughs> so twice Elijah calls fire from heaven. This is this is all ringing, I think, yeah? The Mount of Transfiguration, he's on his way to Jerusalem, they're called fire from heaven. I, I don't think he necessarily wants us to go back and read that all that story, but it's more evidence to me that Luke was saturated in the Old Testament stories about prophets and the coming Messiah. It's just everything, there's a million stories to tell. But this is the way, these are the ones he chooses to tell. Verse 55, he turned and rebuked them and said, um, the brackets there mean, do you have brackets in your Bible? What does it say there about the brackets? Does not, the early text does not contain it. Yeah, so earlier manuscripts don't have these uh, words. Um, some of them do. Um, I chased that rabbit for a while, but I don't think it's worth our time right now. Um, so it says here in my Bible and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of for the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Okay. Verse 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to him. Now in, uh, in Matthew's account of this, we're told that this is a scribe. 
Um, Luke doesn't say it. Um, so I don't know if we're supposed to know that. But Luke doesn't tell us that this is a scribe who says this. Um, just look here for a second. Oh, I should have wrote that down. Okay. It's somebody. Somebody says, Luke says, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, so this is the second person, right? He, he comes up to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. um, Did you say that other reference was in Matthew? Yeah. This, this says Matthew 8, 19. Okay, great. So thank you. <laughs> I turned to 8 and I missed it. Uh, Matthew 8. Yeah. So in Matthew 8, it says, um, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders. So he, this is presented in a different spot in Matthew's presentation. Uh, he gave orders to depart to the other side. Um, and a certain scribe came and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So that's what, that's what I mean. Um, a second type of person. So just think about these people because I think there's maybe something Luke's doing here that's, that's even beyond genius, just unbelievable genius. So because I'm an anatomy geek and I've read the history of Hippocrates and Galen, etc., And so when I first read these uh, in the little commentary, it talked about personality types. I went, whoa, wait a minute. So there may, Luke may be doing something here. I'd, I'd like to get your opinion about that. The second type here, the first is the aggressive rejection. The second type here is, okay. I'll go, send me, I'll follow. Okay, Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. Do you have another word for nest there? In the, Greek. in the margin, it is roosting places. Yeah, so it's not, it's not, a, we think about a nest, you know, where the ba birds having babies and stuff, but really what the, the context, the, the real sense of the word here is this is the place where they rest. This is their home. Their home. It's their home. So they don't have a home. They don't have a home. So boxes have holes, that's their home. The birds, deer have nests, their home, their roosting place. But there it is. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Uh, he said to another, this is the third person, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Now, one commentary I read said his father, there's no reason to think that his father was dead or that he was even close to being dead. Another commentary said he wouldn't have done that. Jesus wouldn't have said that to him or he wouldn't have. Uh, the, the, I don't get myself twisted up here. Commentators have different views on this as to whether he was dead or not. If he had been dead and he had been with his daddy when he was dead, he would have been unclean. So he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have come, probably. So there's all kinds of ways. I've said a bunch of different thought, thoughts uh, about um what does he mean, Lord permit? Is he reluctant? Is he okay? So I'm going to pursue this from a little different perspective here, a third personality type. So just hang on to that. So we got one, the Samaritan's rejecting, and we got two, we got, I will go, I will follow you. And number three, I, I need to bury my daddy. So let's not get too negative about him yet. Number three. Okay. And then uh, he said, Jesus said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. I, th that response is so intriguing to me because he starts off by saying, follow me. And he finishes by saying, go and proclaim. So that's very interesting. Uh, so here's the fourth one, verse 61. What could those mean the same thing? Yeah. 
Yeah. So when we talk about the personality type, we'll come back to that. Help me remember to come back to that. Okay. Okay, verse 61. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. So these are different responses to Jesus and following Jesus. A full-out rejection. Um, one who is aggressively pursuing. A third who is wanting to bury his father. And a fourth who is wanting to go say goodbye to those at home. Verse 62, Jesus said to him, No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom. So, following the prophet, the illustration of a plow, his hands on the plow. Who is this? It's how Elijah called Elisha. Um, don't look back. What comes to your mind? Don't look back. Um, um, Lot's wife. Lot's wife. Don't look back. So I, I just think this is more evidence of. I think about burn the ships. Burn the ships. Yeah. Don't look back. What's the Stephen Curtis Chapman song about that? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, all I remember is yeah. the chorus. Burn the ships. Yeah. Right? Burn the ships. Burn them down. One hundred percent sold out. Mm -hmm. Highly motivated. No way back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So there it is, the introduction, 26 minutes. So we're not going to be able to spend much time with the rest of it. <laughs> but that's, that's the intro to the passage, I think. Okay, so uh, here's a couple of background things. Uh, second slide. Computer, we just went. Come on. There it goes. Okay, so I found this outline um, online. I put the, the website up here of this guy who outlined the book of Luke. Very useful. Um, can you see what the, the red part I've got there, the journey to Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's a major new section. Look at slide number three. Um, I went through and typed up just the travel portions of this travel narrative. So Luke 9 and 13, 17, 18, 19. This is a famous section of Luke. That's what I was saying. And you said these aren't in the other Gospels. No, not this extensive section about his journey. Like it, it, it says he's going on a journey, but there's details about the journey only in Luke. Only in Luke. Okay. Uh, this, whole, this whole section is like 10 chapters of Luke. Um, and the whole book is only 24 chapters. So mm -hmm. um, the other Gospels. He's trying to say something. He's trying to say something about the journey, yeah. Okay, um, one more piece here, and then we'll uh, review the Son of Man for a second, um, and then we'll come back to the personalities to finish, okay? So uh, the next slide, slide number four. So um, this is stuff out of um, this book here. I've got it typed here, the Beale and Carson Commentary on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament. And you see at the top of the table there, it says compare themes, mm -hmm. journeying, sending messengers, the Shema, Foreigners on serving God alone, laws on clean and unclean, wealth, communal judgment. You see all that? Um, now, he gives in his commentary the specific verses, but I just sequenced it out so you can see it big picture with your head here. So Luke chapter 9, 10, 11, 12. You see that through 18? And then the same thematic pieces exist in the book of Deuteronomy from chapters 1 to 25. So... He's playing out Deuteronomy he, in the journey. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was another one that did, blew my mind as well. And I spent a lot of time on it. Um, you have to really read carefully and slowly the whole thing to get thematic pre presentations. It's not like a Jesus was here and he was here at the same place. It's it's a it's a kind of thematic um, one to one correlation there in the book of Deuteronomy. So I read them and I put them on PowerPoint slides and I got bogged down. And so I said, I can't do that for the Sunday school lesson. So um, if you want to look it up, um, get your copy of Beale's commentary and, and spend, I spent about three hours with that. 
Um, and so that's all represented on this one slide. <laughs> but I got a couple of examples. You can see here out of Luke 9, he was traveling. It's the travel narrative toward Jerusalem. Deuteronomy 1, turn and set your journey. It starts with the top of the journey. And then, of course, the Shema, mm -hmm. Luke chapter 10, Deuteronomy 6. I mean, it's word for word quotations mm -hmm. there. But uh, again, the evidence that Luke, I mean, he just, it wasn't that, well, he might have, I don't know. But I don't think he sat down and he, he proposed to himself, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write this down to follow the book of Deuteronomy. I don't think that's what happened. I think he had spent so much time in the book of Deuteronomy that it had influenced the way he thought of logical sequence of presenting things. It was the literature that influenced his, and I think the Spirit of God is doing that with him. But when, when you see a commentator, and this was just one piece, um, the Beale and Carson thing had like four different uh, people who'd done this in different ways. This is evidently a huge topic in common research, the people talking about how Luke is following thematic presentation of Deuteronomy. So I found it interesting. I knew you would. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, the other uh, thing here before we go back to the personality uh, stuff from the passage is the Son of Man piece. Remember, uh, this is slide five. So if you type Son of Man in Bible Gateway, you, you'll discover that um, the, the word Messiah or Christ is used only 14 times in the book of Luke. Jesus refers to himself almost exclusively as the Son of Man. So this passage is another one. This one is another son of man passage. So remember, go to slide number six, the son of man passages, and I've got them listed out here um, in the book of Luke. And if you look over here in chapter nine here, um, there just in chapter nine, there's one, two, three, four, five um, different times he's referring to himself as the son of man. So um, when Jesus is referred to as the son of man so many times, it's worth our time to know what what that means. And so um, there are some famous places in the Old Testament that talk about the Son of Man, but the one that we talked about a bunch was, and I think this is the one that Luke is feeding off of, um, because remember our lesson on, see, 21, 27, the Cloud Rider? Okay, so um, clearly, um, Jesus sees himself as this son of man figure. Luke presents him as the son of man figure. And um, he is very clearly represented as something special in the book of Daniel. So before when we did this, was it a month ago or so, we went through and organized the whole book of Daniel so we could see how important chapter 7 was. That would be that. But I wanted to at least look at this uh, two slides uh, one more time because, um, well, for several reasons, but look at slide number seven. Um, so as the Son of Man is being presented in Daniel 7, um, we are introduced to the Ancient of Days, and his description is his vesture is white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool, um, his throne was on flames, the burning fire. Do you remember why? I had those words outlined when we did that before. The way that she's, she's saying, she's giving me the no. <laughs> okay, so the way the Son of Man is presented here in Daniel, um, it depends on uh, what, what ancient textual presentation of the Son of Man you look at as to how it's presented. So first, first thing, let's do this. So this phrase, the Ancient of Days, here in Daniel chapter 7, appears on a surface reading here to be a different figure than the Son of Man. Remember that now? Mm -hmm. The two different figures, the Son of Man. And then and it switches to one. It, it, it goes back and forth. Uh, 
So it shows you it's he is God, but yet he's separate. Yes. So that's the point that I wanted to make here is when um, when Luke presents the Son of Man in his gospel as the cloud rider. This is where he's thinking about this one riding on the clouds. Um, in verse 13, it says, I kept looking in the night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man. And what I did before is I went, I, I did the prepositions and, and I did the son of man and all the rest of it. So we're not going to do that again, but just look at the summary slide here. On the next slide, remember the old Greek, um, and I'm not going to talk about the differences in the old Greek and Theodosian and Septuagint. We did all that before. It's interesting, but the preposition here is the preposition like or as in Daniel 7.13. So when it reads, go back to uh, verse 7. Um, in the second line in verse 13, one like a son of man was coming and he came up like or as the ancient of days. In Shepherd's commentary, I left the quote here. He says um, on page 91, the old Greek seems intentional in its identification of the one like a son of man with the ancient of days. Theodosian has two figures. The old Greek has only one. So the question becomes, um, if you're reading here the old Greek, then you're thinking, well, is the son of man a separate figure? You have to see him as a separate figure. But is the Son of Man a separate figure? Maybe not. <laughs> That's where you're left. It's very difficult. Um, but um, I think we're on to something because John in the book of Revelation uh, in chapter 1 verse 13, he, he says, and in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a Son of Man, and his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. So this is the image. John is combining the image of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. So what I'm saying is the Son of Man language, and this one will hit you. The Son of Man language is, I think it's Jesus' way of avoiding um, calling himself Messiah early on because that probably would have got him killed earlier. But it's also in technical terms a claim to deity. A claim that he is in fact the Ancient of Days. Now it would have taken someone who was really versed in order to put that together um, but um, I think that's I think that's what's going on here with the Son of Man. Okay, so that's just a review on the Son of Man stuff. Let's finish with the personality stuff. Okay, so in the Peter Lang commentary that's available in Logos, I'm on slide nine. Uh, he says, um, when he writes his summary remarks in this section, he says, it has often been remarked that Luke, without observing a strict chronological sequence, brings together here, so this is talking about our passage, four different characters. Verse 51 to 56, the choleric. 57, 58, the sanguine. 59, 60, the melancholic. 61, 62, the phlegmatic. He says, dot, 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 I skipped a bunch. The evangelist had the definite purpose to portray the Savior's manner of dealing with men of the most different temperaments. Now, just so everybody can get to it, my anatomy book has a bunch of stuff on this, but can you, in your back of your mind, Chris, do you remember learning stories in freshman biology or anything about how um, ancient uh, medicine people would put leeches mm -hmm. on people to suck the blood out of them and stuff? Okay. So all of that weird ancient medicine stuff comes out of um, um, a general concept known as uh, the four humors of human anatomy, physiology, human health. And so I, I picked this off of Wikipedia because it's correct. 
and because uh, anybody can look it up for themselves if they want to read more. So temperament theory has its roots in the ancient theory of humorism, the four humors. It may have uh, originated in ancient Egyptian medicine or in Mesopotamia, but it was the Greek physician, Hippocrates, you see the time period here, um, BC, who developed it into a medical theory. He believed that certain human moods, emotions, and behaviors were caused by an excess or lack of body fluids called humors, hence the leech stuff, which he classified as blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. Galen, um, who was a prolific writer, anatomist, has all kinds of famous works, pictures of anatomy and stuff, a great story to, to read sometime. Galen, who lived, you see where his time period was? Mm -hmm. um, so not long after, yeah? He developed the first typology of temperament in his dissertation, De Temperamentis. And he searched for physiological reasons for different behaviors in humans. So this idea of the temperament, to temper, the word temper means to just mix together. It's a, in their, in their view, in this ancient medieval medicine view, who a person was and their health and their well-being and how they presented themselves and how they thought were personality types. Hmm. It's fascinating to me for all kinds of reasons. But you know about my little research project for the mm -hmm. fall going on here. And Casey's always talking to us about these, how do you pronounce the word? Enneagram? Enneagram. Enneagram. <laughs> <laughs> all these different personality types. Uh, there is, you think, well, they were ancient and they were barbaric and there's no way to connect um, real human science physiology to personality you'd be wrong. So um, uh, if you're interested, any of you guys who are listening to this, if you're interested in, in more of this, just stay tuned. Um, I'll give you just a short of it right here. And uh, you guys could ask Kate. Casey did a research project on this when she was in high school. She did it with junior some high. junior high. So <laughs> it's not complicated. Uh, so here's the, here's the basic gist of it. Um, there's a phenomenon in human physiology that we know of where um, the amount of change in a person's heart rate during a single breathing cycle is a very solid predictive tool in assessing their personality type. This is widely published. This has been known for a long time. And I've done it by demonstration in my upper level courses before. Let students just see for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some connection here. Um, and what I'm, what I'm suggesting here is maybe Luke was, he was a doctor. Mm -hmm. And what if Luke is presenting these four in Luke chapter 9 to tell the informed, intelligent community that Jesus is addressing each of these four personality types. So um, here is their here are their definitions. Um, I pulled just you know the big words off of them. These these choleric, sanguine, melancholic, phlegmatic uh, humors serve as a foundation even for like the Myers Briggs personality test. Mm -hmm. It's it has it has floated down through human society for years. And I am, I am, the more I've thought about it over the past, over today and stuff, just thinking, I'm thinking Luke may have, he may have done this on purpose, these four types, because um, let's put them together, shall we? Well, he's also in a Greek world. Yeah, exactly. Thinkers, and yeah. So they're learning this and thinking this. Yes. So it... Yeah. So uh, the first one in the list was the Samaritans. Yes. independent, decisive, ambitious. This is not our Messiah. He's got to go to Mount Gerizim to be the proper Messiah, yeah? The second one, Jesus, I will follow you, yeah? Talkative and enthusiastic, 
active and social. The third one, I need to go bury my daddy. Deep thinker, a feeler, introverted. Yeah? The fourth one, Goodbye. I will follow you. First, we're going to say goodbye to those at home. Sympathetic, caring about others. I think the commentator, I think Lang here in the commentary may actually be on to something with these four personality types that Jesus is uh, going after each one of them. It, it would be a way, I think it would be a way of Luke saying that Jesus is confronting all human personality types. And they're all stacked up here right at the beginning of his journey to Jerusalem. It's like saying, you all come with me on this journey. You have a choice. Yeah. 100% or nothing. And there's different responses to the call. Different responses to the call. Yeah. interesting yeah okay uh let's see what else i got here yeah so i just i put the four there on slide 10 the rejected messiah the scribe make up your mind don't turn back the last one so personality types everybody <laughs> these are the, these are the big four okay uh, the last slide I stuck in here was the Samaritan thing, in case Christy wanted to look at that again. Um, the Mount Nebal thing about the Samaritans. But Okay, Chris, 47 minutes. Right. Anything you want to add to that? Make the personality type cool. Okay. So, hope you guys have a great week. And uh, hope to see some of you guys soon.